It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 240 of Science on Top for Saturday the 27th of August 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hi Ed. And Lucas Randall. Hey. Well this week uh, my social media feeds went berserk when the European Southern Observatory announced the discovery of a planet orbiting the nearest star to our solar system, Proxima Centauri. To discuss this we're joined by astronomer and astrobiologist at the University of Southern Queensland, Dr John T. Horner. Welcome to the show. Evening, it's great to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have you here because uh, you've written a uh, really detailed article with uh, Tanya Hill from the Melbourne Planetarium on the conversation all about this. And it's really taken uh, the astronomy world by storm, I think. We've known for a while, or we've thought for a while, that there was this planet uh, in the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, there have been a couple of false positives. We talked about one a few years ago on the show that seemed really, really good, and then it was sort of lost in the fuzziness of the data, I guess. Uh, but now this looks like it's confirmed and legit. It's for real. Yeah, it's so exciting. I mean, this is much more promising, much more likely than the ghost planet that never was around Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, around one of those. I can't remember which one, actually, because it was definitely not there. That was really <laughs> bad science. It was kind of the, the plot for that paper, which was in Nature, the plot of the data just looked like someone had sprinkled dust on a bit of paper and then drawn a random line through it. It was absolutely terrible. This one <laughs> looks much more robust, much more believable. Right, so that was the uh, homeopathic approach to science. Just throw random numbers in there and hope it works. Because <laughs> right, then there would to... have actually been numbers. That would have been different. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess the point is that you can fit a line through any set of dots and you find the best fit line. It was a little bit woolly and a little bit unbelievable and we kind of got really excited. I was at UNSW at the time. We got the paper... We had a ASHRAE meeting. It's like, brilliant, they found a plot. Oh, that's a plot. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, well, this isn't going to go very far, is it? <laughs> uh, it All happens right. occasionally. I mean, nature's got a little bit of a reputation for that kind of thing happening occasionally. I remember a thing called Cold Fusion back when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a lot of the top uh, journals have had their moments. Of course, the uh, was it the British Medical Journal or the Lancet? I can't remember. The Lancet. With the whole autism yeah, and fan Wakefield vaccines paper. thing. Yeah. 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 Wonderful, but, wonderful science, that one. <laughs> but let's focus on uh, Proxima Centauri Beat. Now, can you give us a brief sort of summary of the whole Alpha Centauri system thing? Because I think for a while we thought it was just a binary system. Then we found that there's another star, Proxima Centauri. Uh, it's the closest star system to ours. It is for now. I mean, it won't be forever because all the stars in the galaxy are all moving around in their own directions and this is a passing thing, but a passing thing that will last tens of thousands of years. And so bright in our night sky, from most of Australia actually circumpolar, you can see it any time of night, any time of year. You've got this beautiful bright yellow star, Alpha Centauri, which is the third brightest star in the night sky. And unlike most of the other bright stars in the night sky, it's bright not because it's intrinsically far more luminous than the sun, but because it's nearby. It's like the scene from Father Ted, the British comedy, you know, that thing's big because it's nearby, that thing's big because it's actually big and a long way away. Mm -hmm. Alpha Centauri is purely bright in the night sky because it's very nearby. It's the closest naked eye star to the sun, about 4.3 light years away. As technology got better and we started to be able to use optical instruments to look at the night sky, people surveyed the night sky looking for other stars and we stumbled across the fact that, firstly, Alpha Centauri isn't one star, it's two. It's a close binary, one star a little bit hotter, a little bit brighter than the sun, one star a little bit cooler, a little bit fainter, but both very much like the sun. But we then found this other tiny little glowing red ember, a little bit closer to us than the bright two stars, which is Proxima Centauri. And for all, it's the closest star to the solar system, the closest star to us. It's a factor of 100 times too faint to see with the unaided eye. Which is why we didn't know about it until we trained telescopes on the night sky and found this nearby glowing red ember that was making a big wobbly motion across the sky as the Earth went around the sun, which showed it was nearby. Was it found in the infrared re uh, originally? 
No, I believe it was found in the optical original. Oh, wow. I mean, it's magnitude 11. So oh, okay. what that means is yeah. that it's five magnitudes fainter than the typical naked eye limit. But you could probably find it if you knew what you were doing mm. with a fairly low spec amateur telescope. Mm -hmm. You know, an eight inch telescope would have no problem seeing it. So by the time we were doing science in the 1800s, people were very aware of stars of that brightness. Right. And then all you need to do is be scanning the sky looking for stars and doing measurements of their parallax. This is the easiest way to measure the distance to nearby stars. So what you do there is you look at a given star once and then you look a few months later and see if it's moved against the background stars. And the trick here is to visualize it. If you put your finger up in front of your nose and look at it through your left eye and then your right eye, your finger will move from one eye to the other, and the further away it is, the smaller that movement. So that's parallax, and that's how we can measure and we can tell that Proxima really is the closest star to the sun. So its its movement against the background will be um, different to the stars that are further away or closer, in this case there's none that we know of. Absolutely, it's that whole game of parallax. Mm. That's this way that we establish the celestial yardstick, how we tell how far away the different stars are, and we can use different types of measurement at different distances. And the way we measure the closest things is essentially looking through the left eye and then the right eye and then the left eye again. But instead of the eyes being a couple of inches apart like mine are, we take a measurement when the Earth's on one side of the sun and then a measurement when it's on the other side of the sun. So the eyes are 300 million kilometers apart. <laughs> and that means the wiggle is accentuated. But it's still a very small motion, but you can detect it with telescopes. So that's how they figure out how far away it is. Excellent. So now we know that there's three stars in that system. Are they all orbiting each other or are Alpha Centauri orbiting each other and Proxima orbiting the combined thing? Or do we know how that mechanic, those mechanics work? So the mechanics of how it works varies depending on if you want to visualise it accurately or if you want to just get your head around what's happening, essentially. <laughs> um, so a good place to start here is to think about the Earth and the Moon. And... Because it's easier for us to get our head around, we imagine the Earth sitting still and the Moon going round us. But in actuality, the Earth and the Moon go around their common centre of gravity, so they're orbiting around their common centre of gravity, which is itself going around the Sun. But then you can go to the next level of complexity and say that the Earth, the Sun and the Moon are all moving around their own common centre of gravity. So it all gets a bit complicated. This is, though, a little bit hierarchical. So... The two stars, Alpha Cen A and Alpha Cen B, the bright yellowy orangey ones, are close enough together that they go around each other every 70 years or so. So, very much, they're much more massive than Proxima. They're going around their common centre of gravity. At the same time, that common centre of gravity, that point that they're orbiting around, is wobbling around the common centre of mass of that binary and Proxima, which is way off in the distance. Now, because those two stars are much, much bigger than Proxima, it's much more massive, they have a much smaller lap, and Proxima does a much bigger lap. It's like having a very fat kid and a very thin kid on a seesaw. You want to get it to balance, the fat kid has to sit much nearer to the fulcrum. In this mm -hmm. case, you've got two fat kids sat next to the fulcrum and a tiny little baby at the end of the fulcrum arm, way down at the other end, and that's Proxima. Okay. So I all wobbling around <laughs> in this kind of enormous three-person celestial waltz. Except possibly more... If you imagine two people waltzing on a dance floor, and that's Alpha Sen, um, Alpha Sen A, Alpha Sen B, they're going around every 70 years, but we're speeding up, so it's two people dancing on a dance floor. But then they've got a big, long bungee cord attached to them, and way at the other end of the bungee cord, 200 metres away, there's someone walking very slowly around them. So they're waltzing around really quickly, and the person waltzing around, walking around them is taking hours to do one lap. It's that same kind of idea. Right. <laughs> I'm loving big. the visuals anyway <laughs> It's a good job you can't see me My hands are flailing all over the place yeah. <laughs> I was muted when we were talking about the fat kids on the seesaw I'm still giggling about that <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also like thinking that all our listeners uh, earlier on Put their finger in front of their nose and close their eyes and blinking <laughs> Yeah it's uh, amazing when you do that in a lecture theatre full of people because it's fairly dark in there, so they can't see anyone, so they feel fairly brave. <laughs> they don't feel like they can't do anything. And me watching them in the kind of backlight <laughs> from the screen, you can see all these people put the finger up. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so let's bring it forward to the discovery this week then. Um, now, I, it was confirmed by two different techniques, is that right? Um, the men 
thing that's been done, it's two different suites of observations, but they're oh, all yeah. radial velocity observations. Mm. So what we're doing now is if you imagine, we'll go back to our two people waltzing. Mm -hmm. Imagine now that we've got the person that's walking around at the other side of the football field, that's Proxima Centauri, is also waltzing, but they're waltzing with a little toddler. So you've got this big burly person and a little toddler. They're twirling round. The big person, the star, doesn't move very much back and forth around their common centre of mass, while the planet, the little toddler, swings a much, much bigger arc. So, you've got, if you've got a planet going around a star, the two actually go around their common centre of mass, just the same as the Earth and Moon orbit the, their common centre of gravity. Mm -hmm. What we can see, though, is that waltz is happening in a darkened room. It's happening in the dark depths of space. It's pitch black. But Proxima has a little light. It's glowing. It's luminous. The star glows. It shines. So that's the same as our person walking around in the pitch black room with the toddler having a little red light bulb on the top of the head. So imagine that situation. You're looking at that and you couldn't see the toddler at all. You couldn't see the planet at all. It's pitch black. But the star, you can see the star. And you can see the star moving as it rocks around the common centre of mass. Mm -hmm. Now what we're actually doing is we're measuring the speed that the star moves at. We're taking all the light that we get from it passing it through a more complicated version of a prism to break it down into all its component colours, so everything from blue to red out into the infrared. And laced through that region are dark lines. These are the chemical fingerprint of everything that makes up the atmosphere of Proxima Centauri. So hydrogen in Proxima Centauri's atmosphere will absorb some of the light from deeper down in the star and create black lines of very specific colours. That's the fingerprint of hydrogen, and that's the same everywhere in the universe. Those lines are at very precisely known positions. But if the star's moving a little bit towards us, the light from the star is shifted a little bit towards the blue. And so that means the lines are also shifted a bit towards the blue. If the star's moving away from us, the light is slightly red-shifted, slightly stretched out, which means that the dark lines are also moved a little bit to the red. And so if we watch the star's spectral lines, this fingerprint of what makes up the star, over time, and there's a planet there, we'll see them rock to the red, to the blue, to the red, and to the blue, right. over time, as the star rocks back and forth along our line of sight. But this, of course, only tells us it's moving away and towards us. It doesn't really tell us where the thing is that's yanking it around, does it? Yes and no. So what it tells us, the two objects have to be at opposite sides of the centre of mass. If you imagine doing a waltz with someone, your centre of mass is between you and they're always on the opposite side of it, right? So if the star's moving away from us, that tells us the planet must be moving towards us and vice versa. What it doesn't tell us, though, is how tilted the path that the planet and the star are following is to our line of sight. We're only seeing that component of the motion that comes directly towards us and away from us. And you can imagine if the person waltzing around with the toddler, if you, you're viewing them from up above, say you're kind of at the top of the building and they're out on a field, not all of the motion as they wobble around each other is towards you directly. It's actually towards the ground underneath you. So you don't see exactly all of the motion, but you can't tell that that's the case. All you can tell is that the star's coming towards you and away from you. And what that means is that we can infer that there's something unseen there making the star wobble. You've got this hidden toddler is a thing that I keep referring to in our waltzing person. But we've got this unseen object pulling on the star, causing it to rock back and forward. And you can work out how massive that object would have to be if all of its pull is in that direction along our line of sight to make that size wobble with that size period. A bigger, more massive planet would give you a bigger wobble. And that tells you the minimum mass a planet could have, because obviously if the orbit's tilted somewhat to our line of sight, we're only measuring the line of sight component so the real mass of the planet would be bigger. And the ultimate worst case scenario is if the orbits totally face on and then there's no motion back and forth along the line of sight at all and we can't detect it. Right. Okay. So we know we know there's something yanking it around. We know that we're on either a tilt of its orbit or looking at it, you know, best case scenario we're we're looking dead on of that orbit. Um, so we know kind of we've got an a, a lower limit of the size of the planet. We've got a lower limit of the mass of the planet. Now, this is where different techniques that we find planets give us different benefits. So this radial velocity technique, this wobble technique, 
tells us the minimum mass of the planet, and that gives us a statistically fairly firm idea of the mass within about a factor of two. Something like 90% of the planets we find using the wobble technique will have a mass less than twice their minimum mass. So if you've got a one Earth mass planet as a minimum mass, you know it's less than two, with fairly good odds. Okay. And that gives you a hint that it's Earth-like or Jupiter-like. But it doesn't tell you anything about the physical dimensions of it, how big or how small it is. So if you had a one-earth mass ball of candy floss and a one-earth mass ball of metal, they'd have the same gravitational pull on the star and create the same size wobble, but they'd be very different places. Mm. The planets that you hear about where we know the physical size of it, the dimensions, are those that happen to be lined up perfectly, that they pass between us and their stars and block some of the light. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, the bigger the planet, the more light it blocks. So you get a bigger dimming in the star. And that has the opposite problem. That tells you the physical size of the planet, but it doesn't tell you its mass because mm. you're not measuring the wobble it causes. The best case, the ultimate awesome case, is when we can do both at once. And then we get the mass and the size which then tells us the density. And then you can definitely say, well, it must be rocky rather than mm. gaseous. So uh, the, the the coverage of this particular um, discovery is, is indicating that they're very much thinking it, it is a rocky body. So what, what's leading them to that conclusion? The fact that its mass is so small, and it's still more massive than the Earth, of course, but that's fairly tiny as planets go. If it's between 1.3 Earth masses and, say, 2 or 3 Earth masses that's less massive than all of the planets in our solar system that are bigger than the Earth, mm -hmm. Uranus, Neptune, Saturn and Jupiter. They're all significantly more massive than that, right? So that suggests that it would be of low enough mass that it wouldn't have been massive enough when it was forming to pull in and accrete lots of gaseous material from the nebula around right. it. In fact, we think probably to get to capture hydrogen gas like Jupiter and Saturn did in abundance, you need to at least reach 10 Earth masses whilst there's still a lot of hydrogen around to hoover up. Mm. So when it's this small, the odds seem likely that it's either rocky or watery or something like that. In other words, it's solid rather than gas. Right. So that's the thinking in terms of why we think it's rocky. It's based purely on that minimum mass. Now, there's a very, very small chance that the orbits nearly face on and therefore the mass is much, much bigger. But that's very unlikely, just from the law of averages. Right. So it's most likely going to be less than twice the mass of the Earth. So if it was, if it was just that worst-case scenario that we, we were seeing it in such a way that we we're only capturing, we we're only seeing a very small amount of that, that rate of velocity change because we're not dead on, then it could be something more like a sort of a Neptune sort of mass object, perhaps? It could. Mm. Um, that's much less likely, though, and that's why everything's been so bullish in the media, because you can do the statistics. For those of the audience who are a little bit more mathematically minded, when we're talking about the minimum mass, we're actually talking about the true mass of the planet multiplied by the sign of the inclination of its orbit towards us. So what that means is uh, the sign of 90 degrees is 1, right? So if it's perfectly edge on and the orbit's tilted perfectly on so that it will be an eclipsing, transiting planet, yep. then sine of 90 equals 1, and the mass we measure from radial velocity is the true mass of the planet. The more you tilt that orbit away from our line of sight then, the smaller that angle comes, because for some reason they measure the angle to the plane of the sky rather than to our line of sight, the smaller that angle becomes, the smaller the value of sine of that angle becomes, and so therefore the bigger the value of the mass has to be to give yeah. us the minimum mass we observe. Yeah essentially, yeah. right? But from the way that a sine function works, you can make that angle quite large before you significantly boost up the mass of the planet. And that's ah. the reason we can be fairly confident that the mass is more likely to be near to the mass of the Earth than, say, the mass of Neptune. Got you, because there's only like a very narrow sweet spot that, that it would be, you know, that, that the angle would be in order to get a planet that, that mass. Yeah, exactly. Got you. So the bulk of the possible alignments give you a mass that is say, less than twice the mass of the Earth. And that's when people start getting excited mm. because that's the kind of mass where you could have an Earth-like planet with an Earth-like atmosphere and an Earth-like composition and all these buzzwords <laughs> that have been flying around all week. And let's, it's time that you talked about that because the one that we see all the time is habitable and we're also seeing Earth-like. Earth -like <laughs> and Because, uh, well, it is almost certainly in the Goldilocks zone that uh, distance from the star where it can have liquid water 
and thus is more likely to be a candidate to have life. Yes. But it's not really habitable, is it? There's a lots of reasons why this is not a good place to be living. A better uh, answer there, I think, would be we don't know if it's habitable or not. I guess what we're saying at the minute is, and I'm going to change metaphors here a little <laughs> bit, imagine you go to the zoo and you're blindfolded and you just have to walk up and weigh the animals. And all you, you're not actually touching them physically, but you're just lifting them up with a pulley or something. Mm-hmm. And what, what you've got is you've gone over to one of these pulleys blindfolded, you've been led there by whatever kind of brutal, strange person would take you to a zoo <laughs> blindfold and make you wear the animals. Yeah. And they've taken you over and said, wear this animal. So you pull on the pulley and you pick something up and you find that it's about the same weight as a person. And we know how much of a range of weights people have. So you're pulling on this thing and you go, yeah, that's a person-like animal. Mm. That's what we're doing. And think now how many animals we can think of that would have a mass within a factor of two of a human being. And it could be a dog, it could be a kangaroo, it could be God knows what, right? Chimpanzee. Mm. Um, Chimpanzee will probably be fairly human-like compared to some of the options as well. And that's kind of the game we're playing at the minute. What has got everybody excited is the fact that when you know the period of an orbit of a planet around a star, you can work out how far it is from the star. Hmm. That's just the result of Kepler's laws, essentially. The closer in a planet is to the star, the shorter its orbital period. So by knowing it goes around every 11.2 or so days, we know that it's about 7 million kilometers out from Proxima. So, so that sounds really close in. It's really close. Yeah, much, much closer than Mercury is to the sun. So your initial first thought would be, well, that can't be habitable. I mean, I'm surprised it's even there. But then you realize that Proxima isn't like the sun. It's a little dull glowing ember where the sun's a burning furnace. Mm. And so to be at the same temperature as a planet around Proxima, as a planet around the sun, you've got to be much closer in. And that balance means that just about roughly, if Proxima Centauri B is exactly like the Earth, it would be able to have liquid water on the surface. And that's the leap that everybody's made to go, it could be habitable. Possibly, maybe, well, possibly-ish. That's about as far as we've gone, though. We don't know much more about it than that. And as you say, there's a whole slew of reasons why it might not be habitable. But it's as close as we've got. So red red dwarves um, kind of quite tempestuous, aren't they? They they throw out a lot of stuff. They do. So all stars are variable to some extent, some more than others. And what that means is that planets around stars receive a varying amount of radiation, and they also get bombarded by the stellar wind, particles flung outwards from the star. They get subjected to stellar flares, which are what contribute to the aurora borealis Mm. and aurora australis that we see on Earth. Now, Proxima is something we call a flare star. It's a very active red dwarf, which means the amount of high-energy radiation, the X-rays, the gamma rays, stuff like that that it throws out, very quite significantly can get quite high. But it also gives off mega flares occasionally that are much bigger than the solar flares that we've seen, in at least in recorded history in our solar system. And that could be bad, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> So what about, I mean, you, you mentioned the uh, the auroras here on Earth, and of course the auroras are a combination of these flares and our magnetosphere. So is that something that's going to have an impact on habitability of, of, of the planet as well? I think it is. So one of the things you've always got to be careful of when people talk about habitability is that they talk about the habitable zone. Mm. And that's a bit of a buzzword. And all that means is that if this planet is exactly like the Earth, it could have liquid water on its surface. That's all that means. It doesn't tell you anything else about habitability. And when you look at habitability and you think about it as an astrobiologist, you realise you don't just have to talk to astronomers, you've got to talk to physicists, chemists, Mm. biologists, geophysicists to try and work out what's going on. Uh, One of the things I learned a few years ago that kind of blew my mind is, uh, well, we take for granted the fact that the Earth has a magnetic field that protects us from the solar wind. That's why we get the aurora by the poles. And that has shielded the Earth's atmosphere and protected it against the wind blowing it away. So we knew that. What I didn't realise is that that magnetic field is driven by a dynamo inside the Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's thought, at least by some geologists, that that dynamo is only possible because the Earth has plate tectonics. Mm. So Mm -hmm. the logic here goes something like this. The interior of the Earth is hot because there's radioactive decay going on and that keeps it hot. And the Earth is shedding that heat to space. And 
plate tectonics is actually a very efficient way of cooling the upper part of the Earth's mantle down. You lose a lot more energy that way than you would do if you were on Mars, say, where there's a stagnant lid and no plate tectonics. So what that means is that the top of the mantle's relatively cool and the bottom of the mantle's relatively hot. And that temperature difference is big enough for you to get convection mm. currents going. Now, those convection currents cool the bottom of the mantle down more effectively than if you didn't have convection. So that means the top of the Earth's core, which is touching the bottom of the mantle, is cooled more efficiently than it would otherwise be, which means there's a bigger temperature difference in the core between the top and the bottom. And that allows you to have convection in the core, and it's that convection that drives the magnetic field. So if the Earth didn't have plate tectonics, it might not have a magnetic field, and it might not be protected from the solar wind. But then some geologists go one step further than that and say that plate tectonics on the Earth, because the Earth's quite a small planet, would not work without some form of lubricant helping the mantle stay molten enough to support the convection currents. The idea then is that if the Earth wasn't wet, if the Earth was dry, if it didn't have water, it wouldn't have the convection currents and wouldn't have magnetic field, which would mean it wouldn't have the atmosphere being protected. It's almost like a chicken before be the egg thing, isn't it? Because <laughs> in order to have the atmosphere, we need the... Uh, sorry, in order to have the liquid, we need the atmosphere, but we can't have the atmosphere without the liquid. Absolutely, and this is why habitability is a much more complicated and, to be honest, much more exciting question mm. Mm. than you get when you get the five-minute soundbite of it's in the habitable zone, woohoo, because that's just one of myriad features. You start with where the star is in the galaxy that the planet's going around. Are there nearby supernovae? You talk about the chemistry of the system when it formed, how much carbon there was, how much oxygen. You talk about the star, like we said, Proxima is a flare star. You talk about the other planets. You talk about impacts. There's so many things interleaved that can make a planet more or less likely to support life, that we're only starting to really scratch the surface and understand it because we work from a sample of one. We only know one planet with life. And so we have this de facto, this kind of assumption that for a planet to have life, it's got to be like the Earth. Therefore, it must have a big moon. Therefore, X, therefore Y, therefore Z. Yeah. I, get, I think people often forget, of course, that uh, the habitals, but uh, Mars and Venus are in the habitable zone. Mm in our solar system. Depend They're not habitable, though, at the exactly. moment. <laughs> and that's a really good example of why the habitable zone is merely a first step, a first guideline. So it's a helpful tool to direct your attention to the places where, if a planet's like the Earth, it's not crazy to imagine conditions like the Earth for a given set of circumstances. It's also worth noting that the where we define the habitable zone isn't actually locked in fully yet. There's still some debate over whether it should be narrower or broader, depending on how you do atmospheric modelling, depending on how you understand the way that planets change. And a good example of that would be that the more massive the planet is, it may well be the case that it has a more massive atmosphere. If it's got a more massive atmosphere, it's probably got a stronger greenhouse effect. So the location of that habitable zone, although we never really discuss it like that, it's actually probably a function of the mass of the planet mm. as well as its location, mm. in that a more massive planet, if it were closer in, would get hotter than a less massive planet and might not be habitable when a smaller planet would be. But if it's further out, it could be habitable further away. So it's actually quite a complex but really interesting field to be playing around in. So I guess basically we need even more observations and better data on Proxima Centauri B. Are we likely to get that? Is it possible that we will see a transit or something at any time, or is that too uh, optimistic of me? It's going to be a case of, as time goes by, we'll get better and better. So I suspect that around the world, and astronomers in every country are now trying to get their hands on telescope time in the Southern <laughs> Hemisphere, because we now know for definite that Proxima has a planet, so it's worth hammering on that star mm to see if we can catch a transit if they occur. Because there is a chance that this planet's lined up just right that it does transit. And now that we know the orbital period, we can predict when the transits would be, because it'd be when the motion is such that blah, 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 blah. You can tell from the curve of the motion when the planet will be passing between us and the star and therefore predict with fairly good accuracy when a transit would occur if it did. Now, I'm a little bit suspicious that Proxima probably doesn't have transits because I think that it's been observed so much over the last decade mm. or so that people might have picked it mm. up. The caveat on that, though, is that this is not a big planet. This is something not much bigger than the Earth. And so, therefore, maybe the people who've been looking haven't been looking with telescopes that were large enough to detect such a small transit as that. So there's always a chance. And plus, it's so dim now, in the first place. So you, 
Absolutely. I mean, it's a Mag 11 style, which is challenging. Mm. Yeah, so we've got some instruments uh, uh, we'll have access to fairly soon, I believe, that might give us you know, more of that puzzle, or more pieces of it. Yeah, so we're walking along the route that is going to get better and better and better, basically. So currently, there's obviously the option of doing photometry, counting how bright the star is, counting the photons coming into your telescope and seeing if it winks. And that's going to be something that people push hard at just in case there are transits. If there aren't, we have to find other ways of learning about the star and the system. Now, this is where, to an extent, Proxima being nearby works to our advantage. Because for all this planet is very close, and it's only 7 million kilometres out, because Proxima is nearby, that 7 million kilometres on the sky corresponds to about 0.4 arc seconds. That one arc second is a 60th of an arc minute, and an arc minute is a 60th of a degree. So that's about the same separation as if you plucked one of your hairs out, put it down on a running track at the finishing line, and you went and stood at the starting blocks 100 metres away. That'd be the size of the separation between Proxima and its planet. Now, oh, that simple then. Sounds a vanishing, <laughs> yeah, sounds a vanishingly small angle. But we have instruments on telescopes now that can see into that kind of distance. A good example is the Sphere instrument on the Very Large Telescope in South America. The problem is that the planet is going to be vanishingly faint. It's going to be very, very dim compared to the star. It's much, much smaller, so we're seeing it by reflected light. It's going to be faint. So I think it is almost... Well, it's highly unlikely that Sphere will be able to easily detect the planet. But we've got the next generation of telescopes coming online in the next decade or so, we've got enormous behemoth telescopes being built on Earth that are going to be dwarfing anything we currently have. We're also going to be getting space telescopes that make Hubble look like a child's instrument. So we've mm. got these huge new toys coming online in the next 10 or 15 years that will be really well equipped to start trying to peer into the area around Proxima to see whether they can actually see the flickering ember, the little glow from this tiny little planet reflecting the light from Proxima to us. And then, of course, you've got the science fiction end of things. You've got the it's so crazy it might just work option <laughs> of Project Starshot. Oh, nano, nanobots. I was exactly. going to suggest that the other way to get data is to actually go there. <laughs> yeah. So this was big news earlier in the year. I'm sure you talked about it at the time. This incredibly did, yeah. wealthy philanthropist who's throwing buckets of money at lots of interesting science questions. And one of the ones he's done is kickstarting, essentially, for $100 million, researching to whether we could through the power of laser light, send tiny little computer chip-sized spacecraft to the nearest stars. And the idea is accelerating them up to such a speed that the journey to Proxima would only take about 20 years, and then the light would take four years to get back. So a quarter of a century is the kind of timescale where you could actually commit to a science project because you'll get the results within your own lifetime. Mm. Now, It's always handy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so much nicer than saying, we're, we're going to start this now for humanity, but we're not going to get results for 80,000 years. I mean, yes. I'm not quite sure we'll get the money out of the government for that <laughs> one, unfortunately. Um, but what this opens the door for is, if it works, and it's a very big if, it's a big technological challenge, but if that was to work, this discovery has just changed our destination, because... Six months ago, you were doubtless talking about sending the probes to Alpha Centauri, That's so right. it could get some distant photos of Proxima, It'll pass Proxima about 10,000 AU away if it's going to Alpha Centauri, which is 10,000 times the Earth's sun distance. Um, and then we're done past that binary star. What this has done, essentially, is all those people working on Project Starshot have just shifted their target by a couple of degrees in the sky, and they're probably now going to aim for Proxima rather than Alpha, mm. if we get that far. And that would be brilliant, because then you could get the up-close pretty pictures, the holiday snaps, and then probably find out that it's nothing like the Earth at all. <laughs> well, because uh, something else that you mentioned uh, on the conversation is it's very likely to be tidally locked because it's so damn close. Yeah. Well, that said, I mean, it would be around Proxima, like the Earth is around, like the Moon is around the Earth, should I say? Mm. So the Moon takes a month to go around the Earth. In that time, Proxima Centauri be almost complete three laps of Proxima. That's kind of crazy. So what this mm. means is that the tidal influence between the two of them will have gradually spun the planet down, slowed its rotation until it keeps one face pointing towards Proxima all times and one face pointing away. That's the most likely outcome. There is a small chance, though, that if the orbit isn't perfectly circular, 
In other words, if there are other planets in the Proxima system as well, which there could be, mm. you might have a situation like Mercury. So Mercury in our solar system has tidally locked with the Sun, but it's not tidally locked in a one-to-one -one ratio, a mm. one-to-one resonance. It instead is in a three-to-two ratio. So that means Mercury spins three times in the time it takes to go around twice. And it can only be locked in that stably because Mercury's orbit's a bit egg-shaped, which allows it to work. But if Proxima and this is an B's, orbital resonance thing. It is. It's a spin yeah. orbit resonance is what we call it. Um, and so our moon is in one-to-one -one spin orbit resonance. It spins once in the time it takes to orbit the Earth once. And that's why we always see the same face on the moon. Mercury is in a three-to-two spin orbit resonance. So it spins three times in the time it takes to orbit the sun twice. Now, if Proxima B is in a three-to-two spin orbit resonance, then it will have sunrise and sunset. Or should I say Proxima rise and Proxima set. <laughs> And with such a short orbital period as well, that's actually would translate to, you know, not too different sort of day-night cycles. Absolutely. I mean, it would be longer days than on Earth, but shorter days than on Venus, for example, mm. and shorter days than on Mercury. But even if it's in the one-to-one -one setup, that's possibly not as bad as people once thought. So it used to be fairly firmly held that if you had a planet that was tidally locked one-to-one, -one, like the Moon is facing the Earth, what that would cause eventually is for the entire atmosphere of that planet to freeze out on the night side because the night side would never get any starlight whatsoever from its host star and therefore would be terribly cold, so cold that all the volatiles in the atmosphere would freeze out and your atmosphere would gradually migrate around the back and freeze solid. But mm. there's a bit of research that's been done over the last few years that suggests that as long as you have enough of an atmosphere, then weather would be enough to mix to move it around. the heat around. Yeah, mm. and so you'd have a cooler night side but it wouldn't be so cold the atmosphere would freeze out and you could maintain a vaguely habitable climate that may mean that the day side if it were wet would be very cloudy so it would be more like the isle of sky where my parents live where i swear it's cloudy and rainy all the time <laughs> than an australian or climate or melbourne yeah <laughs> well there is also that transition zone where it comes from day to night if, yes. it, is, if it is tidally locked and you don't have weather that could be a temperate sort of medium zone that could be habitable to use that word <laughs> it could so long as you've got the atmosphere and again this is a beauty of science it's not all about the questions we know the answers to already it's about the questions to which we don't know the answers this is what's really exciting and energizing there'll be people around the world running computer models at the minute let's say we've got a planet with this mass with this atmosphere mm. with this insulation this rotation period what happens and watching the weather watching the climate everything unfold in front of them and then they'll get an answer. There'll be papers published in abundance over the next year as people speculate. And that's very worthwhile because it'll help them refine the models, but it will also allow them to make predictions. They can say, if this model is right, then when we have the technology, when the telescopes are better, we should be able to observe it and measure this and test it. And I think that this is what, and this is something I talk about all the time on the show, that the thing that I love about astronomy particularly is all of the pieces of the puzzle that are used to put together to make a picture. It's just awesome. There's all these, these you know, inferences that you can make from what you do know. We know the mass of it already. We know the distance from us. We know, you know, that how, how rapid this, this orbit is occurring and what the tug is and all these little pieces that you can put together to, to extract so much meaning. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of people don't know what is used to come up with these things and and thus, thus they don't really i don't think they're as excited as they damn well should be <laughs> yeah well it's an interesting one so astronomy is very much unique among the sciences i talk about this a bit when i give public talks because i think it's really important to drill home the way we do science is fairly well codified we talk about experiment we talk about theory but in most sciences, if you want to figure out how something works, you can do experiments. So mm. if you're a biologist, you can put a bacteria in a test tube and pour acid on it and see how it responds to acid. Take that! If, <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you're a chemist, you can take the bacteria and you can blow it up and see what happens. If you're a physicist, you put it in a cannon and you fire it across the countryside. You can do those experiments so you can test your theories very quickly. For astronomers, sir, everything we're looking at is so distant, so remote that all we can do is look, we can observe, we do observational astronomy. And so we're not in the role of a 
experimental like that. You can't get Proxima Centauri and put it in a test tube or a cannon and see what yeah. happens. You can only look. So it puts us more in the role of the detective. We've got to find as many clues as we can and come up with a hypothesis to explain what's going on. And then we test it by making more observations. Now, we can slightly do experiments if we use computer modeling, but that's still hypothesis. That's still building a model and seeing what happens. So mm. we're really not in the role of someone who's making a cannon and firing it. We're in the role of Sherlock Holmes, looking at the clues, trying to catalog everything, seeing as much as we can so we can learn more about the world around us. And that's really important because we're trying to understand everything in the universe as scientists from the smallest scales possible of the subatomic particles up to the outer edge of the universe. So we've got an infinitely complex universe that's across an incredible variety of size scales from the tiniest subatomic particle all the way to the edge of the universe. And we're trying to understand that with brains that are not infinitely complex. I mean, they're fairly good tools, but they're not as complex as what we're studying. And so mm. we advance incrementally. We get better observations and better models, and we can learn more, and we build better tools. And part of the moral of the story here is that the discovery of Proxima Centauri B is only possible because we've got better tools, because we've invested, we've pushed the boundary of what we can do, and we've now borne fruit, because we've measured a nearby star that's quite dim, so dim you can't see it with your nerd eye. We've measured the speed that it's wobbling at walking speed. We've measured a velocity <laughs> of that star to a precision of a metre per second. That's just so awesome. It's incredible, and that's <laughs> what we've needed to do to get this kind of result. And the technology is just getting better and better. And it has a great trickle-down for other sciences as well, because... With astronomy, you've got to look at the smallest, the dimmest, the faintest, the tiniest. So you've got to push the envelope of what you can do with the technology you've got, which then trickles down to other fields which are equally important, if not more so, like biology, like medicine, where you're trying to cure people and keep them alive. And if you've got to clamp someone's arteries to stop them bleeding, you don't have time to develop a new detector. The detectors that we develop one day will go on to helping people keep people alive better, to helping them do that kind of work. So there's this whole trickle-down that comes out of this awesome new technology, as well as a simple wonder and glory of what we can discover, of what we can learn. And I think that's a beautiful note to end that discussion on, because I know, Jaunty, you've got to go and watch grown men kick a ball around a field. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I have to do something fun on my Saturday evenings, right? Or torture myself, depending on how the game goes. <laughs> well, good luck to whichever team that is. Um, do you want to uh, give a quick mention, because I think you're giving a talk at the Melbourne Planetarium at the end of next month, aren't you? I am. So I'm visiting Melbourne as part of the Australian Space Research Conference. So this is a meeting we have every year, have a couple of hundred people going along to it. Um, so this is the 16th annual conference. And the conference itself has been held at RMIT in the middle of the city from the 26th to the 28th. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, I'm giving a public talk tied into that conference um, and also working with Tanya Hill, who's a very good friend of mine down at Melbourne Planetarium. So I'm going to go to Melbourne Planetarium on September 24th, which is a Saturday, and talk all about exoplanets, life elsewhere, stuff like that. So that will be a really nice, fun public lecture. Hopefully we'll be able to get a lot of people out and about and come along and listen in. There's another public talk associated with the conference as well, on the night of the Wednesday night, which is at the end of the conference, Wednesday 28th. And that's someone from NASA talking about from the outback to the space station, developing revolutionary spacesuits with NASA and ESA. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of really good talks tied into this conference. And you'd be welcome to come along and come and join us. And we could have another chat afterwards and you could tell me everything I got wrong. <laughs> uh -huh. Definitely would uh, love to catch up and uh, we'll try and see if we can set up another discussion or see what else is happening in space and have a chat that'd be wonderful yeah, that'd be great so the talk itself my one is on the saturday night and starts at about 7 30 p.m and that's at melbourne planetarium so there's information up on the website you can have a search for it find it wow. out and i'm we'll have links yeah. in the show notes to all of that and where's the best place for people to uh, follow what you do is it twitter or your website um, I tweet occasionally, but I only really tweet when I've got a new result or something, or when I'm at a conference. So if anybody follows me on Twitter, they'll get huge long periods of silence and then a couple of days where there's 200 tweets a day while I'm at a conference. 
Um, I do write quite frequently for the conversation. I do recommend all your listeners who are passionate about research, whether it's astronomy or politics or anything, to check the conversation out because it's a fabulous initiative. I don't know how much you guys know about it or if you've gone there regularly. Um, I'm quite a big fan of it. I donate to it and uh, have followed its uh, journey from the start to where it is now, but it's it's a fantastic um, institution, I guess you'd say. That, it's a, uh, it's a really a good idea. Um, so rather than the normal model where a science journalist will talk to a scientist about a story and then they'll interpret it their way and they'll write the article and you do get a certain amount of confusion happen because of that. On the conversation, when there's a big science story like Proxima B, the conversation's editors who are proper journalists, professional journalists, you know, they contact people who are experts in the field and say, here's this cool story, would you write for us about it? So the information on there is coming from people who are relatively expert in the field and I write about my own research on there sometimes as well and I write about other people's stuff when there's a great story to tell like the current one. Excellent. Well, as I said, we'll have all the links to all of that on the website, scienceontop.com, for people to follow the uh, wise words of Dr. John T. Horner. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you ever so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right. Well, Penny, uh, we were just mentioning plate tectonics then and uh, a little bit about satellites and probes and everything. But a few weeks ago, it was announced that the coordinates for Australia were going to have to be readjusted because plate tectonics have shifted where Australia is. Uh, and there's an article on Mother Jones, uh, sorry, Motherboard on vice.com, all about how that actually has a huge effect on all our GPS systems, like self-driving cars, for example, which is kind of something I hadn't thought about. Yeah, I'd thought about it because I know a couple of people who are quite into cars. And, I mean, this is quite interesting because I think that the... Um, the GPS uses information that's about now, because of continental drift or plate tectonics, about 1.5 metres out, which doesn't sound like that much. But if you're thinking about a car, I mean, that's almost, yeah. that's a lane. Yeah. Like if we imagine fleets of Google cars or whatever kind of self-driving car that we have, we might have in the near future, touch wood, because I, for one, would welcome a self-driving <laughs> car. <laughs> Definitely. Welcome, my robot overlord. Oh, I might, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give them my driver's license. Oh, if I could have a little snooze. <laughs> but if the robots do go evil and try and take over things, if they're a metre and a half to the left, we could at least outrun them and um, move them. <laughs> They'd have the accuracy of stormtroopers yeah. in Star Wars. It would also give them away. You could pick them out, you know, pretty easily. Yeah, <laughs> robot car. It's off to the. It's on the. It's on the pavement. It's driving into a building. Yeah. I totally had a dream about this once. It just came back to me. Um, I had a dream. I think it was when I got my my current car because it's got all the lane guidance stuff and it sort of keeps mm-hmm. itself in a lane and stuff like this, which is cool. But I had a dream that I was I was on a long trip somewhere. And I've just gone, okay, car can take care of it, cruise control, lane guidance, I'm going into the back seat to have a sleep. And oh my God. I, I, I like, woke I dream? woke up I woke up from this dream in a panic thinking, What the hell is wrong with me? Why did I think that I could do this? And realise I was in bed. <laughs> But yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for that. I can imagine that. Would I hate be that quite kind upsetting. of when it's just real enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there's no like purple exploding monkeys. That's yeah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, because the car will stop itself with if there's an object in front as well. Like it, oh it tracks God. all that stuff. So in my dream, the car came to a T intersection and didn't know what to do. So it stopped. <laughs> Well, that's better than the alternative. Oh, oh yeah. Keep going past a T intersection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll just go ahead. <laughs> but anyway, um, I didn't actually realise, like, Australia is moving northwards seven centimetres mm. per year. Which so is... That's fi- that's a metre every 15 years. Yeah, and, it, you know, I guess it, without GPS, that wouldn't really matter. No. Because all the parts of Australia relative to each other are the same yeah exactly but, i mean yeah. when you know, in my army days of all, all the you know bush navigation you, mm. you you're only using local topography to navigate it doesn't matter if the local to- topography has moved on the planet you mm. still can navigate fine with a map and a compass and the fix isn't that easy because you might think oh well you know just update the coordinates but yeah. i get the impression for some reason that it's not a simple thing to do 
So I think they're going to go for this kind of sort of compromise solution where they'll update them so they'll still be a bit out and then, you know, in a few years' time they'll be exactly right and then in a few more years they'll be off again so that you can really minimise the number of updates. Like, Mm. I'm going to assume that Australia is not the only country having this issue. I'm sure India is going to get... Some well, every issue. continent yeah. is moving in some way. So that yeah. yeah, well, that's that. the thing. Like, I'm trying to think of the quick, the quick movers. But yeah, is is, is the movement um, in a in a constant direction and a constant speed? I don't know about speed, but all the projections I've seen do show Australia crashing into Asia in pretty much the same way. What? Should we be worried? Not <laughs> Well, my students were pretty excited about that. Oh, we can just like walk to China and go uh, on holiday. I'm like, yeah. yeah. In Jeez, like, it'll really screw up the government though because how very, would they protect very... the borders? Uh, well, there's I'm no sure boats to we stop. still have the same geopolitical sort of systems in like, I don't know, 70 million years. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, that's a like, sobering you know thought. If you're still around in 70 million years, send me a postcard. But, <laughs> but it's not just... odds are not good. It's not just cars. Um, it's going to affect everything from shipping to planes that have some sort of a GPS signal. So even though you know everything in Australia is moving mm. at the same rate, it's the intercontinental thing that's. Well, that, the, I mean, this is why I asked about the 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 rate of of movement and the direction because even normal maps um, have got a um, a measurement on them that shows you. Uh, how much from in terms of angle how much you would expect magnetic north to move uh, mm. each year so that mm. you can look at the date of the the publication of the map and you can say okay based on when this this map was pub, uh, publicized uh, magnetic north was here true north was there but it's been 15 years so you can work out how much that angle has changed because you need to compensate from that mm. when mm. using your compass so i imagine you could kind of build a similar thing into systems car navs and so forth to compensate if if there was a, a constant you know rate of movement and it was in one direction yeah yeah i also feel compelled to mention here uh bing maps uh, really and their mislocation of melbourne i was gonna say are the they a thing <laughs> bing, well, I, there I are bing know, maps it's a thing there's apparently there's <laughs> bing maps you wow. do not want to get into a microsoft self-driving car <laughs> Blue screen. Yeah, (laughs) it's a literal crash. Did I ever tell you I got into an elevator once that had a blue screen of death on it? It was back in the Windows NT days. We got out of that elevator very quickly. (laughs) It was a high rise too, uh, and very quickly is in a safe way, not it plummeted to the ground. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's what we were avoiding. (laughs) Excellent. Uh, But I, I just love that idea of it's one more thing that you don't think about. Of something as seemingly trivial as plate tectonics and continental drift, which can have huge ramifications when you do something as precise as GPS. Yeah, I like there was another um, uh, example in the in the article about uh, agriculture, and I know I was I had a conversation mm. with a friend just recently who spends time sort of in in Western Queensland. Um, he, he does uh, shooting. He's, he basically is a contractor, goes out and helps with uh, with culling of, of uh, vermin and stuff like this, and um, and so he knows you know a lot of the farmers out there, and they and they are really getting into using drones to mm-hmm. do things like patrolling fences to look for fences that are damaged or gates that are damaged and that sort of thing, and it, and it saves them a huge amount of time having these drones that are just pre-programmed on a course. But again, you know, over time, depending on how old the, the information is that they're using, those types of things can be affected. There's also plows that, you know, that basically yep. just do the work for you. You, you, you set, set up, you know, where you, what pattern you want them to, to go in. And these, you know, just think of these great big combine harvesters and stuff like this. And they basically just draw out the thing. You, you can sit in the cab and read or whatever it is that you do. But even uh, mining, uh, all the big mining companies now have massive self-driving trucks that are GPS controlled and they drive down to the mine, they load up all the iron or coal or whatever it is and truck that out. And it's all done remotely and by automated driving systems. That's shocking. I thought it was all about jobs, Ed. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Pardon me. Bless you. Sorry, I forgot to mute. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> 
but yeah, that's that's the automated world that we're moving into, and you've got to take these things into account. And I thought it was really interesting what you were saying, Penny, about the risks of doing a big sort of change all in one go. I mean, we've all mm. thought about updating our phones and having the thing die on us halfway through an update and you worry about whether it's bricked mm. or not. Uh, or we've done a Microsoft Windows update and four hours later it's still going. Meanwhile, every car on earth has crashed if GPS <laughs> took that long to <laughs> update. But uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those problems that you need to in-build an updatability sort of system on it. Very cool. And I think that's our show. Uh, for all the information we talked about um, and all the details about Jonty's talks and his contact details will be on the website, scienceontop.com slash 240. And leave a comment there or on our social media and leave us a, send us an email, feedback at scienceontop.com or a review on iTunes. Thanks, Penny and Lucas. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. As it turns out, all of humanity might have some neighbors. Sadly, we can't go hang out at their place because it would take thousands of years to get there. Scientists say they've discovered a brand new planet that may be a lot like Earth. It's called Proxima B. An artist came up with this picture of what it might look like. Don't you hate that? And while researchers have discovered a lot of planets over the years, this is the closest one to us that could conceivably support life. So could aliens be living just a short hop across the galaxy? The odds aren't good, but they're better than they were yesterday.